Now, let me turn on to uh, our keynote speaker for this morning, Professor Simon Baron Cohen. Dear Simon, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Professor uh, Simon Baron Cohen is one of the world's most recognized figures in the field of uh, autism research and advocacy. He is professor of uh, developmental psychopathology at the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom and director of the University Autism Research Center. Professor Baron Cohen is the author of influential books on autism and as well as more than 450 scientific articles. Let me mention a few of his most notable works. They include the Mind Blindness Theory of Autism, which uh, he formulated in 1985, and the Fetal Sex Steroid Theory of Autism in 1997. In 1999, he created the first clinic in the UK for adults suspected of having Asperger's syndrome, which has helped more than 1,000 individuals for, to have their disability recognized. Among the many awards and honors, Professor Baron Cohen has received are the Spearman Medal from the British Psychological Society and the McCandless Award from the American Psychological Association. Professor, it's a great honor for us to have you here and we really look forward to your lecture, ensuring that we will learn more about the issue we are dealing today with. Thank you very much. Please take the lecture. Good morning, and first of all, thank you, Christina and Ambassador, uh, for this uh, very warm welcome to the United Nations. At least 1% of the world's population is on the autism spectrum, which equates into some 70 million people with autism on the planet. We are here today to make sure that the world is thinking about them and their families. Autonomy and self-determination for people with autism cannot be separated from a discussion of their human rights, which is the focus of my address. Before we consider human rights and autism, what is autism? Autism is a spectrum of neurological disabilities involving difficulties with social relationships, communication, adjusting to unexpected change, dealing with ambiguity and entailing sensory hypersensitivity and anxiety. Autism also leads to a different perceptual and learning style so that the person has a preference for detail and develops unusually narrow interests and an unusually strong preference for facts, patterns, repetition and routine. Autism is an example of neurodiversity, that our brains are not all wired the same. Differently wired brains lead to different profiles of strengths and challenges and should not be judged as better or worse. They are just different and people with autism are asking for two reasonable things, acceptance of their difference and respect for their difference. Autism is caused by genetic factors interacting with environmental factors and is often accompanied by medical symptoms such as epilepsy or gastrointestinal difficulties. People with autism need a diagnosis to reflect that they are suffering and need support. Autism is not a disease in the classical sense because although it invariably leads to disability, it often also leads to talent, for example, in excellent attention to detail and excellent ability to spot patterns. The autism spectrum is broad because at least half of people with autism 
have good language and intelligence, whilst others have additional disabilities in language development and in learning. But all people with autism, like everyone with a disability, have legal capacity, even if they need support to make decisions and need safeguarding. Let's now turn to the topic of autonomy and self-determination for people with autism, which, as I said, cannot be separated from their human rights. It is fitting that we are discussing this here in the UN since the first universal charter of human rights in the history of our planet was created right here in 1948. Before 1948, there was no international universal charter that protected human rights. That was how, for example, in Nazi Germany during the Holocaust, people with intellectual disability were killed in their thousands under the compulsory euthanasia laws. Many of these individuals likely had autism, even before we had a name for it, as the first report of autism by Dr. Leo Kanner was published during World War II. Let us remember the Holocaust victims with autism, since unlike other persecuted groups, where there were some survivors who could speak out, those people with autism who were killed by the Nazis are largely forgotten. Violations of the human rights of people with autism go back further than that, since here in the US, in the 1920s, in the name of eugenics, many states passed laws to compulsorily sterilize people with intellectual disability, including those whom today we would recognize had autism. That was why the world cried out, we need a universal charter for human rights. In 1948, the newly created United Nations adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, to my mind, one of the most important documents ever written. The declaration lists 30 fundamental human rights, and they should be compulsory reading in schools to ensure that we and our children all learn them. Fast forward to 2006, basic human rights were still not reaching people with disabilities. So the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities was adopted, again here in New York. It now has 160 signatories from around the world. Surely, you might think, today, people with autism enjoy human rights to the same extent as everyone else. Sadly, this is still far from the case. I haven't got time to look at all 30 human rights, but let's look at a handful of these to see how people with autism are still deprived of human rights. First, the right to dignity. According to the National Autistic Society in the UK, half of adults report that they have been abused by someone they thought was a friend. A quarter of adults with autism have had money stolen from them by someone they thought was a friend. And a third of adults with autism have been manipulated to do something they didn't want to do, again by someone they thought was a friend. These so-called mate crimes arise because the person with autism is vulnerable because of their social naivety, their tendency to take what people say at face value. What kind of a world is it where half of adults with autism report they stay home because of fear of being abused in some way. Individuals with intellectual disability, including those with autism, are three times more likely to be victims of abuse or neglect, robbery or assault. So, on this first human right, the right to dignity, as civilized nations, we are failing to protect the rights of people with autism. Second, the right to education. Again, the statistics are shocking. One in five children with autism have been excluded from school. They may be excluded for many reasons. Whatever the reason for being excluded, they are being deprived of the right to education. And of the other 80% of children with autism who have stayed in school, miserably, half of them report having been bullied. 
Bullying makes a child feel bad about him or herself, feel rejected, and develop fear and insecurity. Bullying turns a child off school so that many children with autism avoid school. Being bullied in childhood is a risk factor for depression. Many teenagers with autism drop out of school so that they end up with few formal qualifications despite their good intelligence or they underperform in exams because of their unhappy educational experience. In France, 80% of teenagers with autism do not attend secondary mainstream school. I have visited some fantastic examples of educational good practice for children with autism, which show what can be done when we design our schools to be autism friendly. But these awful statistics again suggest we are failing to protect the rights of people with autism. Third, the right to equal access to public services. One in three adults with autism experiences severe mentally, mental ill health because of lack of support. I work in a clinic for adults with Asperger's syndrome, a subgroup of autism. Two thirds of them have felt suicidal and one third of them have felt so bad they have attempted suicide. In new research from the universities of Cambridge and Coventry in the UK, we have found that among those who have died by suicide, approximately 12% of them had definite or probable autism. Every suicide is a personal and a family tragedy. Let us have a minute's silence to remember those people with autism who have died by suicide. Finding such a shockingly high rate of autism in people who have died by suicide is not surprising when you consider how many of these individuals did not have the benefit of early diagnosis and instead struggled undiagnosed and without proper support. Early diagnosis is possible in childhood. There are screening measures that can detect autism in toddlers but most countries do not screen for autism in the preschool years or indeed even in childhood or during the teens. In the UK, in many areas, the waiting time for a diagnosis can be up to a year or longer, leaving the person confused and with no help. Waiting a year for a diagnosis would be totally unacceptable for other medical conditions, but autism remains a low priority for health service funding. Even when a person gets their diagnosis, a person with autism gets their diagnosis, they are often left with no follow-up, feeling marginalised and excluded from society. In high and middle income countries, people with autism may receive a formal diagnosis, but in low income countries, the majority of people with autism may be undiagnosed, either because of stigma or ignorance or lack of basic services and specialist clinicians. So, regarding the right to equal access to public services, once again, we are failing to protect the right of people with autism. Fourth, the right to work and employment. A shocking statistic is that only 15% of adults with autism are in full-time employment, despite many having good intelligence and talents. The right to work should extend to everyone whatever support they might need. Employment makes one feel valued and included in society and gives one autonomy to determine one's own life. Unemployment makes one feel excluded, unvalued and leads to low self-confidence and low self-esteem. Unsurprisingly, 
unemployment is another well-known risk factor for depression. The barriers to employment for people with autism are many, but one may be discrimination at the interview stage if this depends on being able to make eye contact and the ability to communicate, as these are key areas of disability in autism. Thankfully, some enlightened employers, like the German company Auticon, the Danish company Specialistern, and the German company SAP, are setting the example of how to help people with autism into employment and how employers can make reasonable adjustments for people with autism. But, at present, on the right to work and employment, again, we are failing to protect the rights of people with autism. Fifth, the right to protection from discrimination and the right to a cultural life and to rest and leisure. I have met people with autism who have been asked to leave a supermarket or a cinema because of their different behavior. This is discrimination and again would never be tolerated for other kinds of disabilities. It is excellent that some supermarkets like Tesco in the UK are adapting their stores to make it easier for people with autism to shop in a less stressful way. And some cinemas are holding autism friendly screenings where people with autism can enjoy a movie in any way they like. These are rare examples of good practice, but the fact that many people with autism have been asked to leave public places means they are still not enjoying the basic human right of protection from discrimination. In addition, half of adults with autism report feeling lonely, a third of them do not leave the house most days, and two thirds of them feel depressed because of loneliness. One in four adults with autism have no friends at all. They are clearly not enjoying the human right to enjoy a cultural life and the right to rest and leisure. Finally, the right to protection of the law and the right to a fair, impartial trial. One in five people with autism have been stopped and questioned by the police. Five percent of them have been arrested. Two-thirds of police officers report they have received no training in how to interview a person with autism. Many legal cases involving someone with autism result in imprisonment for crimes the person with autism may not have committed or for crimes others committed but the person with autism became tangled up in because of their social naivety. Some of these crimes are the result of the person with autism becoming obsessed with a particular topic, a product of their disability, and yet the courts often ignore autism as a mitigating factor. So on the, these last human rights, the right to protection of the law and the right to a fair impartial trial, we are still failing people with autism. We can see from just these few examples how people with autism are still falling outside of human rights and therefore experience huge barriers to autonomy and self-determination. Those who are minimally verbal face the most risk of their rights being overlooked unless they receive support in their decision-making and receive adequate safeguarding. Let me end with a call for action. First, along with major charities such as Autism Europe, I call for an investigation into the violation of human rights in people with autism. Second, I call for increased surveillance of the needs of people with autism in every one of our countries so that each year on Autism Awareness Day, we can look forward to seeing a reduction in such violations of their human rights. Finally, we need to be continuously asking people with autism what their lives are like and what they need so that they are fully involved in shaping their future. Only when the human rights of people with autism are truly respected will we be able to see them enjoy autonomy and self-determination. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Baron Cohen. Thank you very much, dear Simon, for this uh, uh, keynote address on uh, the discriminations that uh, uh, people with uh, autism are facing and the tremendous amount of work needs to be done in order to tackle those discriminations. Thanks very much for encapsulating so vividly the issue which is at the core of the discussion that is going to follow up now.